Is religion even worth arguing about? Well, my answer is yes, absolutely yes. Religion is worth arguing about. We've all heard that in polite company, we should not discuss sex, politics, business, or religion. Those topics are too troublesome, so we should stick to safer topics. And of course, some topics uh, like that are inappropriate on some occasions. You know, one doesn't hand out business cards at a funeral, right? Teachers should not be hitting on their students. And even if it's the day before the big election, right, one does not make campaign speeches at a four-year-old's birthday party. Examples like that aside, we are human beings. And to be human is to grapple with the big questions and the crucial values of life. So we must decide. We all need to make up our minds about what our lives will be about. Now, solo reflection is the most important part of this process. But discussing major issues with other people can and it should be a useful learning experience, especially when we're young, but it doesn't stop then. Learning how to argue well socially is important for one's own cognitive development, but also uh, learning how to do that well strengthens the open, liberal, democratic, republican society that most of us think is the best kind of society. Much of such society's work is done through discussion and debate and argument, so we need to be good at it. But start with a, a more personal case. Suppose you are approached by a 15-year-old girl who knows you and trusts you. you know, perhaps you're a family member, right? a, a coach, a counselor, a teacher, or just a good friend of the family. And she knows that you're a thoughtful and a decent adult, so she's come to you for some advice. What should I think about religion, she asks you. I've been reading and thinking a lot about it she continues. And I know there are many answers from atheist to agnostic to many kinds of belief. So she pauses for a moment and that gives you a few moments to get your thoughts together. And then she says, and I'd really like to know your opinion, she says. Well, uh, how do you respond? You know, you might feel an impulse to avoid the question. The topic is uncomfortable or it's difficult or it might lead to social unpleasantness. And you know, all of that may be true. But it's also true that part of the pleasure of growing older can be imparting one's hard-won wisdom to those starting out on their life journeys. And especially in the case of parents and teachers who explicitly choose to become nurturers and guides of the young, preparing people for life's biggest challenges and for being a role model for dealing with those challenges, well, that's built into the choice to become a parent or a teacher. So this really then is a best case scenario. We have a thoughtful, questioning, open-minded young person who actually wants to talk seriously with you. Now, those are the moments that one should prepare oneself for, to hope for, and actually to look forward to. Now we know by contrast, sadly, how some adults have dealt with young people who ask big, important questions. Right? They've indoctrinated their children long before, right? making it clear what the child must believe. And in many cases, they even undercut the growing child's capacity for thinking about those beliefs. Maybe they've done so by reacting in authoritarian fashion uh, to any child that asks a difficult question. They tell children who ask questions that they are not competent to think about such things, that they should trust and believe what their elders tell them. Others will uh, actually resort to threats and actual compulsion. They will inflict verbal abuse upon questioners, and their harsh words may be backed up with a slap or a beating or confinement or threats of future pains for deviance from the beliefs that their parents or teachers want them to accept. But some adults, uh, and happily in my judgment, I think this is a growing minority, will actually reason with their children. From a very early age, kids ask why and how, sometimes incessantly, and the grown-ups in their lives think through the issues with their children. They do their best to present the facts and explain the reasons in a way that the child can grasp. Now, my view is only the reasoning method is legitimate. Indoctrination is beneath contempt, appeals to authority prove nothing, Responding to questioning with threats or compulsion is a pathetic confession of intellectual weakness and an outright evil. 
The truth about religion or any issue can only be known by a mind that assesses the evidence and judges it independently. As issues become more complex, that is to say, as the amount of evidence that must be considered grows, and as the number of interpretive possibilities that must be evaluated increases, explicit attention to argument and counter-argument must be engaged in. That's the only way we can figure out the truth or the best beliefs in those areas. The mark of a responsible mind, and this is not merely a cognitive responsibility, it's a moral responsibility, those two are integrated. The mark of a responsible mind concerned with truth is a commitment to going where the best Best arguments lead. Now, sometimes it's said that, you know, before the age of reason, children must be told what to do and that their cognitive and physical habits must be formed by authority. You know, why they need to bathe, why they need to eat their vegetables, or why they should not run in the street. You know, those can't be explained to a two year old. So adults must make them do the right things and to develop good habits in their children by conditioning right, rather than reasoning. Fair enough, sometimes, but the capacity for reasoning is developmental in a child from day one, from the beginning of the entry into the world. So parents must also be sensitive to what a developing child can and cannot grasp. And when the child can understand, then reasoning and not conditioning is appropriate. Simultaneously, the cultivation of the child's reasoning enables him or her increasingly to understand the reasons for the earlier conditioning before the age of reasoning. And of course, part of coming to intellectual maturity as we grow older, as young adults, is re-evaluating for oneself all of the major beliefs and habits that one has acquired from one's parents and teachers. Now, all of this is especially true on matters of religion. Religion is a kind of philosophy. It provides answers to life's questions about who we are, where we came from, and what really matters. Answers to those questions are vitally important to each of us in our own lives, and the adequacy of the various religions' answers is naturally a critical issue for all thinking human beings, and we should all be thinking human beings. But the only way to evaluate the adequacy of the different religions and their answers is by looking at the evidence, by assessing the religious claims fit with the evidence, and by comparing the competing religions and anti-religions arguments with each other. Now, that is a lot of work, no question. And of course, some people are put off by the difficulty of the task. So they'll fall back on easy faith of believing whatever beliefs they happen to have been raised with. But obviously an accident of social geography, right, where, you know, where one happened to have been born, that doesn't prove or even make likely right, one's beliefs. Or some people are put off by the fear that they might discover that their beliefs are wrong. You know, they might have to admit mistakes on matters of religion. They might have to change their minds to a belief that they currently find repellent. So they become subjectivists. Right? But obviously, you know, believing something because you want it to be true or rejecting something else because you don't want it to be true, both of those practices are anti-truth. Some people, of course, are put off by the social difficulty of the task. Independent thinking can and very often does put one at odds with prevailing beliefs. And we all know that other people can make one's life a social misery by inflicting punishments for deviating from the crowd. So many people fall into a compliance mindset going along with whatever most people in their social circle happen to believe. But the important point here is we are human beings, not sheep. And a follow the herd mentality is also anti-truth. We've also all likely had the experience of trying to discuss reason, uh, reasonably religion with someone and learn that it often does not go well. And that's a problem. And the problem, you know, to use a dancing metaphor, is that it takes two to tango. And the occasions are rare when both dancers are good at it. Reasoning is a complex set of skills, and reasoning together is even more complex. So frustration along the way is also to be expected. But as with tango, 
when the skills are mastered after lots of practice, the results can be beautiful. Now, I don't want to be too pessimistic here in my judgment. I think we're getting better as the modern world progresses at thinking about religion individually and socially compared to generations past and centuries past. More people now know how to think. More people are aware of the alternatives. More information is easily available about religions and the alternatives. And there are many more discussion and debate forums now being used increasingly by more people. So we are, I think, going up the learning curve now, often messily, but upward even so. And a whole new generation of thoughtful 15-year-olds is also arising. So this is the question we come back to. What should we say to them, those of us who have thought much about religion? Well, we should present the arguments clearly, passionately, and civilly. We should do our best to assess their merits and demerits fairly. We should encourage young people and anyone who is still thinking through the issues to do the same. And in the final analysis, we will respect each individual's need to make his or her own best judgments. What are the best arguments for and against religion? Next, I want to emphasize a methodological point, right, and set aside strong versions of faith. We're talking about arguing about religion, and that does mean setting aside all religions that are based on faith. Now, here we're using faith in its root sense as a, as a verb, as a way of coming to believe and make a commitment to a belief system, not necessarily faith as a noun, which is a derivative and sometimes uh, used uh, way of just describing a set of beliefs, right? Whatever one happens to believe, that's your, that's your faith. But what we are interested in is the method of coming to belief, and faith in, in, in its root is a matter of believing despite evidence or in the absence of evidence. What we are considering is the contrast position of reasoning or argumentation where one comes to one's religious belief based on looking at the evidence and reasoning and arguing about it. Now, not all religions are equal when it comes to argumentation. So, you know, we can imagine arraying religions along a spectrum from the most to the least rational. And it's a useful uh, exercise to place religions based on one's knowledge of the religions that are out there along a spectrum from those that are at one end that explicitly reject reasoning and those at the other end that explicitly embrace it. And we also know that uh, individually, this is not something that's confined to religion. Other domains of belief uh, exhibit the same psychological mechanisms, but there are many advocates and opponents of religion that are animated more by angers and enthusiasms and other psychological forces that make them unwilling to reason, you know, either to present their own views clearly or even to give other sides views a fair hearing. But at the same time, there are religions that do emphasize the importance of evidence and argument in support of their position. So to the extent that they are genuine right in doing so and, and many are that's the positions that we are concerned with here so I'm going to set aside some of the uh, explicitly irrationalist religions and their apologists you know that will include several versions of Christian apologetics you know, Tertullian's you know famous I believe it because it's absurd right check out the original Latin Martin Luther's claim that re reason is the devil's whore Soren Kierkegaard's uh, claim that faith requires the crucifixion of reason. So all of those explicitly and strongly anti-argumentation approaches to religion, we're not going to consider them here. Other religions, of course, aside from the Christian apologetics uh, that I just mentioned, have their parallel faith apologists as well. So I'm going to take up only those that are rational, right? That is not only in terms of their public professions, but in their cognitive heart of hearts. And here each of us individually have to make our own judgments because we know best what's going on inside our own minds. That is to say, we're interested in those who, when they say they are going to argue about religion, they are willing to argue all the way down. And if by contrast, right, you uh, are one of those people who secretly know you're committed to a religious belief and that's not going to change no matter what, 
then my advice would be, uh, and my request would be socially, don't go through the pretense of semi-arguing and retreating or just using argument as a public cover for what is really a subjective commitment. As with the 15-year-old and the 15-year-old inside all of us, we really have to get the truth correct here and just believing what we want to believe or whatever we happen to believe is an anti-truth position. We have to look at the evidence and the logic, and that's where we need to go. Now here, I think uh, in the history of religion, there are three types of uh, pro-reason advocacies in varying degrees. There's one position that holds that religion is entirely rational, and that the evidence and the logic, uh, if properly attended to by an open mind, prove the position of their religion. They will argue that absolutely no faith is required, and then in their stronger form, they will argue that indeed faith is a bad thing, right? Faith uh, means coming to the belief without using one's God-given talents for perceiving the world and using one's God-given power of reasoning to, uh, to figure out what God wants from the world. So Galileo Galilei, in his letter to the Grand Duchess Christina, for example, published in 1615, going by memory, I think is a good representative here. William Paley, in his Natural Theology, published 1802, again going by by memory here, Uh, another person who argues that an open-minded person who looks at the evidence will come to believe that uh, the religion that uh, they're advocating is true. Now, a more moderate position is uh, expressed, for example, by Thomas Aquinas and others, and this position will argue that reason and faith are two legitimate and complementary ways of coming to belief, that reason can all by itself, or pretty much all by itself, prove the existence of God, but that also faith for those who are not capable of reasoning is uh, also a legitimate way, and that reason and faith will reach the same con. Conclusion, uh, even though by by different routes. Now, a third variation on this is uh, a position, and I think that this is among many per- religious believers, particularly in the modern world, perhaps the most numerous. I don't have good data, but this would be a good survey if one could uh, could probe the psychology and get to get good data on it. But the belief that religion is rational, but the what reason will do is not prove conclusively that there is a God, but that uh, believing in God or believing in a religion is pretty reasonable. That's to say that reason can get you most of the way, and faith closes the gap. That then is to say that there's a kind of an epistemic gap between proving or knowing for sure that God exists and the amount of evidence and logic that supports that belief. So the idea here is then that religious belief can be demonstrated to a large extent to be rational, and then faith is the gap closer. It's a legitimate way to close the gap between what you can pr- prove and what a full commitment to the religion, uh, religious belief is going to require. Now, when I continue this series, I'm going to be looking explicitly at some of the major arguments for and against the existence of God. So the claims that the arguments for the existence of God are sound, I'm going to take those up later. But for now, I want to just focus on this gap-closing position. So let's let's work this one through. Suppose we grant now, just, just for the sake of argument, that if you look carefully at the evidence and the logic, that it makes it, say, 80% likely that a God exists. And of course, you might disagree and find the arguments are totally unconvincing. You know, you might judge that they make it 0% likely or 40% likely, right, or whatever. Or you might be a person who disagrees and find the arguments totally convincing. That is to say, they make it 100% likely. But let's, let's uh, set those positions aside for now for the sake of argument and say, suppose you and I both look at an argument for the existence of God and we say, hey, this is a pretty good argument, not totally totally convincing, but I would say it makes it 80% probable, say, that a God exists, and you you agree with that. So, there is still a gap between what the argument and evidence shows and the full belief commitment that most religions require. 
Because most religions then want you to be all in, to believe totally, to believe absolutely, and to act totally on the basis of the, the commitment to, to the belief system. So the question then is, what are we to make of the gap? What's the rational policy in, in that case? And here, I think some analogies to other important areas of judgment are helpful in clarifying the, the cognitive principles involved. So religion is important, uh, are important like values, how we're going to live our lives, uh, you know, absolutely critical, but we only are 80% convinced that our religion or a religion candidate is, is the right one. So let's try another area in which important values are at stake. So let's take a medicine example. Suppose that uh, you, know, you consult a physician and you are carefully examined by the physician and a consulting physician uh, also uh, concurs and says, you know, the evidence shows that you are 80% likely to have condition X, right? whatever it is. And then you bring in a consulting surgeon uh, because the, the, the physician says, you know, this, uh, if you have it, and I'm 80% sure that you have it, uh, should require an operation. And then the consulting surgeon then adds that if he were to operate on you, you would have an 80% chance of survival. So what should one believe and commit to in that circumstance? All right, let's try the law. All right, suppose you're a judge or a jury in a criminal trial and your assessment of the evidence, you've weighed the evidence carefully, you've heard the arguments on both sides from both sides' attorneys, and you come to the judgment that it's 80% likely that the defendant is guilty. Well, what judgment should you reach in that case? So you're 80% convinced that the arguments prove a God exists. You're 80% convinced that you have a medical condition. You're 80% convinced that the defendant before you is guilty. The principle, the proper cognitive principle, is that the degree of one's belief should be tied to the degree of the evidence. And this is on a sliding scale. If there's very little evidence, but there is a little evidence for a position, whatever the issue is, then one judge, it's a possibility. If there's a preponderance of evidence, then one should judge, it is probable. And if the evidence is conclusive evidence, then and only then should one judge its a certainty and then act accordingly. So to go back to the legal example, for example, uh, we, uh, we ask and we expect jurors to be able to understand the differing standards of evidence required for conviction in civil and criminal cases. The preponderance of evidence versus beyond a reasonable doubt. So we believe based on the preponderance of evidence and we know what that means in this particular case or we believe beyond a reasonable doubt and we know what counts as a reasonable doubt or not so in life in general part of cognitive maturity is being able to assess evidence on a sliding scale and to adjust one's beliefs accordingly then that principle applies in all matters of life including religion. So if one's best rational judgment is that the preponderance of evidence and logic show that God does exist, then one's belief state should be it's probable that God exists. And one should not push out of one's mind the remaining 20% of doubt. One should remain open-minded to that extent. That is, one should remain open to new evidence that will increase or decrease the 20% margin of doubt. Now, faith is the practice of ignoring that margin of doubt in order to feel convinced intellectually and wholeheartedly filled with conviction. In my judgment, that's the most common type of faith strategy. Most religious people are not totally irrational. They do think they have, there are some evidence and arguments that make their religion reasonable, but faith is properly used to describe a belief commitment beyond the evidence, and it is meant to be the gap closer, and that's how most people, I think, use it. And it almost always is an emotion-driven process, uh, sometimes a little bit of laziness, sometimes a little bit of social fear, but it's a process in which one wills one 
to believe that which one wants to be true. One wants one's religion to be more than a likely hypothesis, more than a probabilistic account of the way the world is. So here we do enter into some very rich and complex philosophical and psychological territory. And part of it is that as human beings, we do long for passion in our lives. And part of it is knowing that life's greatest rewards in most areas, work, love, religion, and so forth, they usually require sustained commitment. And part of it, of course, is knowing that we need to make those weighty decisions and commitments in the absence of complete and accurate information. So in more abstract language, the question is of the relationship between reason and emotion and making and sustaining these important life commitments. Now, again, I think some analogies might help clarify the principles involved here. So, yeah, let's turn to hunting. Now, suppose you are hunting and you're hungry and you really love rabbit stew and you judge that as you're out there in the woods that it's very likely that the rustling in a bush is the rabbit that you've been stalking. Now, should your desire to make the kill so that you can feast upon tasty rabbit lead you to commit to the shot? You know, it's very likely that it's a rabbit, but the rustling might also merely be the wind or it might be a small child who is playing in the area. So how committed, uh, based on your desire to close that gap, should you be? Try a war example. Right? You're a general, right? Or imagine a general who seeks battle glory and, and, and whose nation is desperate for a victory. And you think it's probable, highly probable maybe, or significantly probable, that uh, his troops are going to prevail if he attacks now rather than later. Should his desire for triumph lead him to commit his troops wholeheartedly into battle? Politics, try an example here. Judging political candidates, we know passions often run high. And how many times during presidential elections do voters become filled with enthusiasm and express their conviction that their candidate will save the nation if only enough people believe in him or her? So the question is, should we encourage or discourage this psychological phenomenon? You know, hunting for food, that's important victory or loss in battle that is important politics that's important religion that's important but what's the role of careful assessing of the evidence and believing accordingly versus uh, making that kind of extra commitment to what one desperately wants to be true so should we encourage right or discourage this psychological phenomenon now perhaps we should only consider cases involving other kinds of passions right seeking material blessings triumphing over death wanting a messianic leader those also can be religion motivating passions sometimes though also uh, advocates of religion will appeal to love as an animating passion right one should love one's god with all one's heart for example so in addition to politics and war and hunting let's also consider love love is another very important part of life and can be an example now earlier i uh, i suggested the device of talking to a thoughtful 15 year old girl who's sincerely asking for advice about religion. So how would the love analogy help us here? You know, 15 year olds are certainly capable of forming intensely passionate commitments to particular love objects. You know, for example, to that 16 year old boy in her literature class. And it is likely true that one could not argue her in or out of love, right? But her experience of love is hardly a guarantee that the boy really is the true love of her life. Perhaps he is, but the rest of us are, you know, going to be justified in reserving judgment and advising her to keep an open mind, wait for more evidence, and not to move more too quickly, rather. Perhaps a better example of love is to imagine that the girl has grown into a 30-year-old woman, and she has now had some significant experience of love won and lost. She's now dating a man, and maybe she's 80% sure that he is the great love of her life. And she knows at the same time that she wants to be madly in love and to make a lifetime commitment. So 
She also, though, knows about the phenomenon of love goggles and how desires can distort perception and judgment. She also knows that people can, people rather can project qualities onto others that they don't actually have. She knows that people can make disastrous commitment choices that lead to suffering and divorce. So yes, she should be open to love and to making commitments, but as an older and wiser person, she should also be alert to any counter evidence, warning red flags, for example, and she should be willing to fall out of love should the object of her desire prove to be, despite initial appearances, a loser, a brute, someone with other qualities healthy to a healthy relationship. Being 80% sure that someone is the love of your life, that does not warrant, it's not appropriate to make a wholehearted emotionalist commitment. And the same should be true of the religions that we are considering. The analogy of romantic to religious love does have a limitation. In the case of you know, romantic passion, we already know from the outset that the person we're dating actually exists. And our question really is just about how much trust we can have in that person or how strong a commitment we should make. But in the case of religion, though, we first have the problem of establishing that the being, the God, actually exists. So that will then take us to our next question. Suppose that we are seriously committed to arguing about the existence of gods and the truth of religions. And our next question in, in this series of podcasts will be, do the evidence and the arguments show that a God really exists? <laughs>